Today we celebrate the transfiguration of our Lord, which we have beautifully depicted in the stained glass window all the way on the, your left-hand side in the very back over there. And it is a good depiction of what happens. Our Lord is raised up between heaven and earth, shining like the sun. And on either side appear Moses and Elijah, representing the law and the prophets. And then there at his foot we see three disciples, Peter, James, and John. One of them looks like he's texting. Uh, I don't know if you noticed that in his hand over there, but uh, these stained glass windows were put in before cell phones were a thing, so I think that's just a trick of the light. Nobody ascends a mountain by accident. It's something that you have to do intentionally. Every single footstep as you ascend the mountain is a reminder that I'm going uphill. So as our Lord brings Peter, James, and John to Mount Tabor, which, by the way, if you go on the pilgrimage next August, you'll be able to see. As he brings them up the mountain, they are doing this, he is doing this intentionally. And there's three different mountains that are prefigurements of the transfiguration that I'd like to go over today because it helps us to understand and appreciate the event of the transfiguration. The one is Mount Sinai where Moses receives the Ten Commandments because Moses is there. The next is Mount Carmel where Elijah defeats the prophets of Baal and Elijah is depicted there. And the other one is Mount Tabor but in the Old Testament. So all three of these mountains teach us something about the transfiguration, and especially what Peter and James and John would have been thinking about as they're intentionally going up this mountain. So the first one is Mount Sinai. We know the story. As the Israelites were in the Holy Land, the 12 brothers, or the 11 brothers, sell one of their brothers into slavery in Egypt. And as a punishment, they themselves become slaves in Egypt. But they cry out to the Lord for help, and the Lord forgives their sins. The Lord has mercy on them, and he restores them back to the Holy Land. And as they're traveling back to the Holy Land, there on Mount Sinai, our Lord gives Moses the Ten Commandments. And there's a lot of prefigurements in that event of Mount Sinai as well as the Transfiguration. The first is the glory cloud of the Lord descends upon the mountain. The Israelites are afraid to even approach the base of the mountain because there's earthquakes, there's thunder, there's lightning. Moses goes up alone. And as he's up there, his face becomes resplendent, shining, just like we see here in the Transfiguration. His face starts to shine after he witnesses God. So much so that when Moses comes back down, he has to wear a veil over his face because his face is shining so much. So there we see a couple of prefigurements in Mount Sinai where there's the sinfulness of humanity, the brokenness of humanity, being met with this miraculous mercy of God along with this great manifestation of divine power. That happened on Mount Sinai. The next is with Elijah and Mount Carmel. The background to Mount Carmel is King Ahab marries Jezebel, and Jezebel is a worshiper of Baal, a pagan god. And so Ahab falls into the worship of the pagan deity Baal. And he allows his wife Jezebel not only to worship these pagan idols, but also to persecute the prophets of God, to imprison them and to put them to death. So Elijah is one of the prophets that's fleeing from Jezebel, but God gives him the word of prophecy, and he has this standoff, this prophecy competition with the prophets of Baal. So they go to Mount Carmel, and there he essentially has a competition. He says, we're going to build two pi piles of wood, and we'll put our sacrificial offerings on top of them. You guys you prophets of Baal, you guys pray to your idol, and I'll pray to God, and we'll see which one ignites miraculously. 
So the prophets of Baal go first, and apparently part of their rituals, and this is maybe why they were so popular, they had this attention-getting ritual where they would dance around in this wild, extravagant way, shouting and screaming, hooting and hollering. They'd stab themselves with daggers, and they'd sprinkle their own blood everywhere, and it must have been quite a spectacle. But of course, nothing is happening. And while they're doing this, Elijah is sitting on the sidelines, kind of mocking them, saying, maybe your God is away on a journey. Maybe he's asleep. Maybe you need to shout some more. Maybe, maybe he's doing his business. That's what he says. Um, nothing happens. And then, in contrast, Elijah simply prays to God, and in that simple prayer, whoosh, the pile catches on fire. And so that marks a turning point of the end of the, the worship of the Baals and the restoration of the faith right there on Mount Carmel. So we see once again that we have a mountain. We have the sinfulness of the people had turned away from God, especially the king, Ahab, had turned away from God. But then that sinfulness meets with the mercy of God in this miraculous event on a mountain. And then lastly, there's Mount Tabor in the Old Testament. This comes to us from the book of Judges. So the background to that is that the Israelites again offended the Lord. It doesn't tell us exactly what they did, but it just says, the Israelites again offended the Lord. So the Lord allowed them to fall into the power of the Canaanite king Jabin. The general of his army was Sisera. The, but the Israelites cried out to the Lord because with his 900 ch iron chariots, he sorely oppressed the Israelites for 20 years. So for 20 years, they couldn't do anything because I guess 900 iron chariots was a big force in those days. And so they cried out to the Lord. And the Lord sends the prophetess Deborah. She was one of the judges of Israel. And she calls Barak to lead an army out to Mount Tabor, which is where eventually the transfiguration will happen. And there on Mount Tabor, under the prophetess Deborah, the Israelites defeat Sisera, and the general, and the Israelites are free. So once again, we see there's the background of the sinfulness of humanity meeting up with the mercy of God in this miraculous exchange that happens on a mountain. So here we see three of those events that are depicted right there in the Transfiguration event. So Peter, James, and John would have known all of these three stories and have been thinking of this as they ascend Mount Tabor. And of course, there they are, Peter, James, and John, representing us, sinful humanity, broken humanity, weak humanity. And then there, our Lord is transfigured before them, a divine manifestation a miraculous showing of his power. And then, as they descend, this is the turning point in the Gospels. Because after the transfiguration in each of the Gospels, now the narrative points towards Jerusalem and the crucifixion and the resurrection. And that is the mercy of God, the definitive mercy of God, for which all of those other events were prefigurements. The, transfigur the transfiguration is the fulfillment. Brothers and sisters, today, as we come before the altar, this is our transfiguration because the same Lord that was transfigured on Mount Tabor is present with us today. In fact, this is one of the reasons why we have the high altar traditionally built in this way with the three steps leading up to what's called the predellum up there as if this is like a little mountain that we ascend every Sunday to get a glimpse of our Lord. We bring our weak human nature. We bring all of our burdens before him. And here, in this little Mount Tabor, in this little transfiguration, our Lord gives us a little glimpse of his glory, and he empowers us with his mercy, making up for our weak human nature by his divine power. Let us come before him today to worship him, to give him thanks, and to be strengthened by his divine manifestation right here in our church.